let's go ahead and uh, stand, if we would. And we're going to go ahead and read the scriptures together. If you're new here, I'll read the black, and then you, Coralie, read the red. It keeps you awake a little bit, rather than just being passive recipients of the word. Now you're active. So, little teacher trick, sorry. I am retired, but there's still some things that carry over. Here we go. Acts chapter 7. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness. Instructing Moses to make it. Which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua. Whom God drove out before the face of our fathers. Who found favor before God and asked to find. But Solomon built him a house. However, hear the turn there. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Has my hand not made all these things? You, whoa, jeepers. Stephen, settle down, tiger. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets? And they killed those who foretold. Of whom you now have become. Who have received the law by the direction of angels. When they heard these things, and they gnashed at him with their teeth, but he gazed into heaven and saw and Jesus standing. And he said, look, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and ran to him, ran at him with one accord and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and crying. Then he knelt down and... Oh, I ought to have the heart of Jesus. Lord... Do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, give us the heart of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Forty-three verses, right? Stephen giving them a lesson, a history lesson. Right? It's kind of like your parents telling you the same thing over and over again. You're like, I already know. But he's given them a history lesson going through Abraham and Joseph and Moses and letting them know two things. This is how incessantly God has loved you, cared for you, protected you, led you, forgiven you. And then the other thing, their conduct. Summed up in two thoughts, really. This is how you return the kindness of the Lord, by incessantly rejecting his authority and those that he sends to you, the prophets, the testimony of God's word, the angels, and the greatest of them all, Jesus Christ. Rejecting those. And then today, we're going to see another dangerous thing, especially when coupled with rebellion and rejection, is resisting the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit knocking, knocking on their doors, knocking, wanting the scales to fall from their eyes. But they have uncircumcised hearts and ears and they can't hear. And today, we're, we're, we're seeing Stephen switching gears, reminding these religious leaders that God cannot be contained. You cannot confine God to one denomination, to one building, to 
to one race, to one sex, to one nationality. You cannot do that. The universality of Christianity. Go anywhere in the world and you will find a brother or sister eventually. You'll look in their eyes and they, oh, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. How'd you do it? Oh, I did it with Ukrainian words. I did it with North Korean words. But I gave my life to Jesus Christ. There, there, there's really no room for any racism in the heart of a Christian, is there? But he switches gears and he's going to stop talking about people so much and the people that God sent and he's going to focus on things, actually one thing in particular, the tabernacle of witness. He's going to talk about this thing because it's very important to the Jewish people. Well, let's look at what Stephen gets into, besides a lot of trouble. Verse 44, he says, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed. Our fathers. This is a shared history. Stephen is saying, listen, our fathers had this tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, and here's what it looks like. Wilderness, and they're protected only by tents made out of animal skins. Has anybody ever done some camping? I like camping because it's intense. Oh, the drums are gone. <laughs> but you know, if you've done any tenting, I'm not talking about glamping, you know, that where they're in the huge campers. I'm talking about in a tent. You're like, after two or three days, you're like, please let me go back to my posturepedic. I want to go home. It's just like no fun. And it's kind of what's stirring in David's heart. He's like, how can our great God dwell in this. But notice it said that God appointed it. This was God's idea. You're going to be wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years and you need a place to worship me, a place where I can come, where all the holy things and the priests can minister and, and sins can be dealt with by the shedding of the blood of animals within the tents. And inside the tent, of course, you have the Ark of the Covenant, that holy thing that they would carry on poles. If they ever touched the box, they would, they would die because it was so holy. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant are these cherubim and their wings outspread, one on one side, one on the other. So the entire box and the idea is of these cherubs. They're a high class of angel. By the way, Satan was a cherub. And by the way, Satan most likely had something to do with worship, music. It all kind of makes sense, old rock and rollers, doesn't it? What a tool that can be to get people off the track. But instead of protecting, because the idea is they are protecting the holiness of God, because if that holiness gets out of that box, if their wings went like that, what would happen to you and I in the presence of God, in his holiness, without the covering of Jesus Christ? What would happen? Fried. Fried. You, you saw, you know, the, the movie where the guy's eyes melt, you know. But that's inside of this uh, testimony. It's a testimony. To who? To God and to his goodness. That phrase Actually, tabernacle of witness is used 25 times in Scripture. But here's the interesting thing. It's only used in five verses in the Bible, but it's used 25 times. The tent of meeting. It's where you met with God. It's a sacred tent of Yahweh, but it's temporary. Temporary. God prescribed it. He gave the designs to Moses there in Exodus. He said, this is the pattern. This is the blueprint. This is how I want you to make it. Every aspect, of every detail, God gave it to them so that they could worship with God, so that they could sacrifice to God and give offerings of thanksgiving. The Hebrew word for tabernacle, ohel edut, the root of which is shadow. We've been talking about that the last couple of weeks through Peter's thing. Joseph, 
a type or a shadow of what would be. This is Old Testament. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So there's these types. The Noah's Ark. That's not just a cool thing to tell the kiddies. That's an actual historical event. Go look at the Grand Canyon. There's one of your proofs, right? But that's not just about Noah and those people. That was symbolic of what would come. See, if you got in the boat, you got through the flood safely. If you didn't get in the boat, you're toast. And then Jesus came along and died for our sins on the cross, rose from the dead, and if we're with him, we'll make it safely to the other side. So it's a type, a pattern, a shadow, this testimony, this place where they would come and worship. And in verse 45, it says, which our fathers, having received it in turn, what does that mean? It means it was passed on. Like the recipe for grandma's cookies. I could tell you my grandmother's recipe for her cookies, but then I'd have to. No. <laughs> Although there is one recipe that's in my head stored up here, a recipe for pizza dough, that my boss, who was Italian, said, if you ever give this out, there's going to be trouble. I'm not exactly sure what he meant by that but I never want to find out. He's no longer with us, but you still can't have the recipe. God showed him the pattern. And then he received it in turn and it got passed down as matters of succession. And, and that's a model for good ministry, isn't it? You should never leave a ministry and just like, oh, there's a hole. You should be raising up somebody behind you to take over that ministry. There should be a succession in whatever we're doing. But then we get into Joshua. With Joshua, and he brought it with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles. You remember, 400 years of slavery, 40 years of wandering. But in the midst of that, Joshua, of all people, Joshua the son of Nun, chosen to be Moses' successor. Joshua, by the way, is the Old Testament equivalent of Jesus, Yeshua, Yahshua. Yeshua, Jesus. Forty years helping Moses, right? Moses' little apprentice. He's like, you know, Dennis, the guy that wants to be the dentist in the <laughs> Rudolph the Red-Nosed Rainer. I want to be a dentist. <laughs> Joshua just wanted to serve the Lord. And he was faithful. And for some reason, he's the one that gets to bring the people into the promised land. He gets all the glory. Moses had to deal with those Israelites for 40 years. I mean to tell you, I mean, we look at it, we probably would have done the same thing complaining, you know. Honey, do we really have to have pizza again tonight? Seriously? Manna falling from heaven, God sending food from heaven, and they're eating, and they're sustained, and they complain. They complain, right? Manna again. This stinks. Well, I'll give you something else to eat. God says, quail. Mmm, now you got my attention. Okay, no more of that oatmeal type stuff. And then I get some, some good meat, some quail. And don't you know they, they complained about that. God said, I'm going to bring you so much quail, it's going to come out of your nostrils. Joshua, leading these people around, why didn't Moses get to bring them in though? Because he struck the rock. He misrepresented God, and as a natural consequence of that, he was not allowed to bring them into the promised land. Here's where it gets interesting. If you look at your Bible, the first five books of the Bible are called the, starts with a P, Pentateuch, right? They're the, and they're written by who? Starts with an M? Okay, so it's written by Moses, these first five books. But wait, wait, wait. So, and that ends with Moses not being able to bring them into the promised land, and then Joshua is declared to be the successor, and Moses goes the way of all men. What's the very next book? Joshua. 
Boy, that's kind of interesting. I don't want to make a doctrine out of this, but the first five books of the Bible are Moses and the law. And then the very next book is Joshua and him bringing them into the promised land. Remember, Joshua is the Old Testament equivalent of Jesus. The law that God gave to the Israelites can only bring you to the promised land, but it cannot bring you into the promised land. Only Jesus can bring you into the promised land. Isn't that kind of a cool little thing? Until the days of David. This need for the tabernacle was going to be there for a long time. All the way to King David. King David, you know, you remember the one that would, would be king. The, the, the guy that slayed Goliath. Said, I'm just a little red-haired, freckly kid. But he's not going to blaspheme my God like that and stand out there and us not do anything about it. So he gets his sling and his stones and whew, one shot, boom, right there. You know, great story for the kids. Right? If you want to make them sleep well at night, tell them David and Goliath. Ah, that's a. But David is also the same man who slept with Bathsheba, a woman, not his wife. That's called adultery. They were not married. That's adultery. And then, in his wisdom, to cover that up, like a cat covers up its stuff, he decides, I'm going to have Uriah killed. Uriah is Bathsheba's husband. So now, adultery and murder, and yet this is the same man that Stephen declares David found favor before God. I get a lot of hope out of that. I hope you do too. God nowhere is asking any one of us to be perfect. The only one that's perfect is Jesus, and he wouldn't have had to die if we were all perfect, but he had to die. And Stephen's mentioning that David found favor before God. I mean, may we all find favor before God. Grace is another word for that. Hebrews 4.16 says this. It should be up on the screen. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Jesus' throne is a throne of grace. And we're allowed as kids, it says here, to come boldly to it. Don't even have to knock. that we may obtain to find mercy and to find grace in our time of need. Earlier I gave you an opportunity to cry out to God, to call out to him, because we can. This verse declares that we can go to God at any time, and whatever we're struggling with, we need victory over this sin. We ask God who gives to all without finding fault. And it's David, the same David who penned so many of the Psalms. One in particular shows David's desire to build God a proper house. And it, and it was a good desire, right? It's not a bad desire. I want to build God a house. But God is going to show him that it's a little bit misguided. Psalm 132, you'll see it up on the slide. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go up to the comfort of my bed. Do you hear his commitment to this? It's great. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord. It's not right that the Lord doesn't have a place to rest. I want to give him a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Likewise, 2 Samuel 17 says, a uh, great chapter, but basically in that chapter, David, again, is shown as having a good desire, but God, through the prophet Nathan, informs David, listen, David, this is not my desire for you to build me a house. In fact, David, you have it all backwards. And then in verse 12 through 14, we see how he will build David's house. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed, 
singular, masculine, who will come before you, come from your body, out of your lineage, your descendants, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That cannot be said about any human kingdom. No human kingdom has ever in the history of mankind lasted forever. There is only one who's last forever, singular, masculine. That's messianic prophecy, isn't it? That's all about Jesus who will come and build not a house, but an ecclesia, a church, a family of God. Not filled with brick and mortar, but the Holy Spirit indwelling the believer. It's a beautiful picture. And, and Stephen needs them to see that because they, they, they have garnered so much pride over these beautiful buildings they've built. Oh, look at these beautiful buildings. You know? And Jesus said to him, what? Not one of these stones will be left on another. That's Herod's temple. And it happened exactly as Jesus said. There was not one stone left on another. That temple destroyed. Solomon's temple in 587 B.C. destroyed. Beautiful. But destroyed. Verse 47. David, you're not going to do it, but your son Solomon, he's going to get to do it. Solomon, we know, is the, and most people would agree, if you ask Say, hey, what about this Solomon guy? What was he famous for? Wisdom. When given the opportunity to write a blank check, God says, you ask me anything and I will give it to you. He asks for wisdom. Wisdom is the proper application of knowledge. You can know something but not know how to apply it. Knowledge, the burner's hot. Wisdom, don't touch it. Wisdom is what he asked for. He's the wisest man on the earth. And he did build an amazing temple. Look at the picture up on the screen. Gorgeous. I mean, pounds and pounds of gold. Pomegranates and just share of it. All just gorgeous. Everything prescribed. Everything goes here. This goes here. That goes there. All the measurements. They're boom. 1 Kings 6, 11 through 13 says this. God tells Solomon something very important. We need to keep this in mind, I think. And he needed to, to as well. This is what really impresses me, God says. Do you want to get my attention? You can build me a nice house. You can do this or do that. But you know what's really going to impress me? It's up there. If you walk in my statutes. What is he saying? If you walk in obedience, that really gets my attention. Do you want God to pay attention to you? Obey his word. Obey his commands. Do what he says. For you call me Lord and Savior. But do you do what I say? Walk in obedience. Verse 48, again, that however, these all these beautiful buildings, and God was behind it. God was met with his people, and then they built a permanent structure, but it was destroyed. However, that's okay because God does not dwell in temples made with hands. He dwells in man temples that he made. I mean, what mystery because look what he says he he refers to the prophet isaiah 66 1 through 2 heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool got together with a couple they have these really cool glider rockers and i literally almost fell asleep the company was great but you know the glider rocker is just so nice you ever been on one of those and just rock a bye and i was just almost out but they had a footstool and I couldn't help but think about this. Okay, so let me give you some facts. Earth. Earth. How big is it? 
24,900 miles around its belt. 24,901 miles. Then going down the meridian, it's 24,860 miles around. God is saying, I am massive, immense. You just don't even have an idea. Because I'm outside of time. I'm the one that created all of this. And if he created all of the universes and all the galaxies, why, I guess he would have to be pretty big. So it's almost like backwards hyperbole. Because usually hyperbole, we're, we're, we're making it ridiculous on one side, but he's making it ridiculous on the other because even heaven couldn't contain him. Nor could the earth really be his footstool. He's so immense. Solomon's temple, by contrast, listen to this, 100, and, 100 feet long, 100 feet. I don't know how many feet are in a mile. It's 2,000 something, 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 652. Is that it? 2,652? Somebody. Okay, so I, I, was, I did a half a mile run the other day. Okay. But my goodness, 180 feet long, that's a pretty, pretty big house. 90 feet wide, 50 feet high. You talk about cathedral ceiling. I don't want to paint that house because <laughs> you're going to have to get up on some serious scaffolding. To, but see the contrast? It's like, where is the house that you're going to build from me? And then he closes that. God says in Isaiah, he says, has not my hand made all these things? Let's not get it backwards. He, his, his hands have made all those things. Psalm 102.25 says this, Of old you, God, laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. God made the world. What does the world say about how the world was made? Lightning struck ooze. Okay. That begs the question, where'd the ooze come from? And where'd the lightning come from? No, the explanation is that God made it. His handiwork. You and I are his handiwork, aren't we? We're knit together in our mother's womb, beautifully, wonderfully made. And Stephen shows these guys clearly that God can be worshipped anywhere and by anyone and at any time. I am not advocating for universalism, but I am saying Christianity is universal. Any heart can understand the gospel and come into the faith, no matter what color, sex, any of those things. The door is wide open for anyone, not just the Jews. See, they had developed a bit of a racist attitude toward Gentiles, hadn't they? Leave that for the dogs. We call it Gentiles dogs. Not a nice term. Then we get to verse 51. The fun stuff. Stephen going right for the jugular. Going right down the pike. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. With an exclamation point. He's not holding back any punches. But by the way... That is not the first time these people heard, or people like them, their grandfathers or great-grandfathers that heard or were called stiff-necked. Now, has anybody in here, like when I was a kid, this would happen to me frequently. I would wake up, and my neck would be like this. But I'm trying to walk this way. I'm not trying to look that way, but my neck is stuck. I'm stiff-necked. And so I'd have to go to school. Lee Fox, present. Mr. Fox, look at me when I'm talking to you. <laughs> Did anybody else get those or is it just me? It was brutal, you know, because, I mean, how to feel cool by Lee Fox in school. <laughs> Walking around like this. Stiff-necked. Stiff-necked. Exodus 33, 1 through 3, let's look at that. This is a, another instance. He says, I will send my angel before you. I'll drive out the, all those ites. I'll go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. 
hey, good job, I didn't do the, the ite joke, like termites and, you know, you go Jebusite, termite. <laughs> See, you wouldn't have gotten a laugh, so I'm, I'm glad I didn't do it. Go up to a land flowing with milk. Oh, what are you kidding me? For I will not go with you. Moses takes umbrage at that. He's like, are you serious? What do you mean you won't go up with us? Lest I consume you on the way, what's the reason God won't go with him? Because you're stiff-necked and you're making me want to consume you because you're so stiff-necked. Obstinate, stubborn, unyielding, not listening, not believing God, not trusting God. They were stiff-necked. I mean, there are times, aren't there? I, I think there is something to be said about being stubborn for Jesus Christ, standing firm, not being rude, not being untoward, but being, firm. no, this is the truth of God and being stiff-necked. But this is stiff-necked against God. I will not listen to you. I will not have you having any authority over my life. It's my life and I'll do what it, with it what I want. And how does a stiff neck happen? It happens because they're uncircumcised in heart and ears. That's, that's interesting. Because we know that they were circumcised. They're Jewish. And on the eighth day, when vitamin K comes out of the woodwork so that blood can be clotted, the protein that causes clotting just happens to be on the eighth day, and that's when the males were supposed to get circumcised, and they get circumcised, you know. <laughs> you, you know what I mean, right? Can we move on? <laughs> Whew, it's hot in here. <laughs> but Stephen says these are uncircumcised in heart. And, and what's the deal with circumcision is to take away something because something gets hidden underneath that, and it gets foul in there, and disease and illness gets in there. And so they got to cut away the flap, get rid of that thing so that there's nothing that would get in the way, that would block, something that would cause unhealthiness. Our hearts can be like that. We, we can't believe because our hearts are not circumcised. We can't hear the gospel because our ears are not circumcised. They were circum circumcised by ceremony, but spiritually, no. They could not hear, they could not believe because Stephen diagnoses it. John eight thirty seven through 38 says this. Jesus speaking, he says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Whew. Lord, may it never be for any of us in here that his, see what that means is it, has, it can't find a home. The word won't find a crack or a crevice where it could enter into a man's heart. That's what uncircumcised hearts cause, the inability to hear God's word. And there was no cure for the uncircumcised heart or ears. Just kidding. What's the cure? Well, let's look. But before we get there, let's get to the next thing that he says. But you always resist the Holy Spirit. That word always is emphatic, and the reason it's there is Stephen is letting him know that from Abraham all the way to Jesus, you've done nothing but resist the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there to convict us of truth, of falsehood, of judgment. The Holy Spirit's in our lives to keep us in the guardrails of truth that our lives... Listen, we were talking the other night, 21% of pastors in the world don't view the world this way. They, wait, they, they, they don't have a biblical worldview. Are you kidding me? This is life. 
you're in the right place. We're studying the word and we're seeing that we need help for the uncircumcised heart. Oh, by the way, side note for the married couples in here. First of all, go to that conference. You will be blessed. If you need help to get there, we'll figure something out. We have a benevolence fund. If you can't afford it, you can't afford not to go. It's going to be great. But as far as marriage, that word always, (laughs) don't use it. You always do that. You always do. Conversation stopper, right? That's going to bring peace about. No, it's not. It's going to cause trouble. Don't use the word always. But here, Stephen Wright to use the word always because it's true. Every attempt on God's part, bringing them truth, these guys resist the Holy Spirit. How many opportunities does a man get? How many opportunities does a woman get for the Holy Spirit to convict them and say, listen, you need Jesus. How many times are, you gonna, are we going to sit there and just allow our uncircumcised heart to remain that way? But maybe, maybe you don't want it to be that way. So pastor, how about a solution? Because Isaiah 63, 10 tells that if I rebel, I'm grieving the Holy Spirit. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. You can't grieve a force. Luke, the force is with you. Oh, the force can't be grieved, but a person can be grieved. And he's grieved when we rebel. To have circumcised hearts and ears It's clearly what they lack. So what's the fix? Leviticus 26. Didn't know I was going there. You're like, oh, we we skipped that. Don't skip any books in the Bible. Leviticus 26, 40 through 42. But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me and that they have walked contrary to me, if I resist the Holy Spirit, I am walking in a way that is contrary to God. If I'm walking in step with the Spirit, I'm walking with God. And that I have also walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies. Wow. So when we walk contrary, God will give us over their desire. So he'll just walk with our enemies for a little while to teach us. Don't do that anymore. Why would you go over there and eat slop with the pigs. Come home, like in the story of the prodigal. If they're, oh, there it is. If their uncircumcised hearts are humbled, how do you get a heart to be circumcised? Dropping your pride. Getting to the place of humility, humbling yourselves before God. Humble yourself and I will raise you up. The way up is the way down. Then I will remember my covenants. Verse 52. Which of the prophets did you not persecute? Let's look at Hebrews eleven thirty-two. Is that up on the screen? Yeah. This is 35. Others were tortured. Speaking of the prophets whom they killed or tortured or maimed. Look at what some of them went through. Let me ask you a question before we read it. Is it possible that one of these people could be you? It's about to be Stephen. And I got a question for you. Do you think Stephen for one second regretted the words that he said to these people? I'm going to prove to you later that there's no way he did. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And following Jesus. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings, being whipped. Yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, not like in Colorado, stoned by stoning. They were sawn in two, were tempted. Sawn in two, that's no magic trick. They actually would saw people in two. Tempted, slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, but... Can I add something in there? They were filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit, weren't they? Just like our friend Stephen. 
And look what it says, of whom the world is not worthy. Listen, if you suffer for Christ, the world is not even worthy of you because you believe and you won't back down. Which of the prophets did you not kill? The only ones they didn't kill were the ones that they paid for. Oh, don't bring that prophet here. He's always pronouncing bad news. I don't like that guy. So the kings would pay for their prophets. Oh, yeah, bring those guys. They're always, you're gonna, you know, like the horoscopes. You're going to meet somebody new today. Oh, my, I met somebody new. How did they know? Ridiculous. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Nehemiah, Amos, all treated poorly for the sake of the gospel. They killed those who foretold the coming of the just one. Who's the just one? There's only one, Jesus, the righteous one, the only one who lived a sinless life. Raise your hand if you have lived a sinless life up to this point. I'm just giving you time in case you want to slide that. Okay, good. Good, good. All right. But he gets even more personal. Of whom you become betrayers and murderers. Not polite. This is not a seeker-friendly message. Where's the softness? Well, because it's true. And they need to know. They need to be confronted with their sin. Because they have rejected and rejected and rejected and rejected. And sometimes people don't respond to grace and you have to give them the law. Law to the proud, grace to the humble. When you're presenting the gospel with somebody, remember that. Law to the proud, grace to the humble. The person that already, oh, I don't, I, I think Jesus is real, and I, I want to give my life to him. Well, you don't need to walk him through the law. Betrayers. Who's the most famous betrayer? Judas. Murderers. Like the one that they swapped out for Jesus, Barabbas. Stephen's saying, this is the group that you belong to. A bunch of murderers and betrayers. You had every opportunity not to be like your fathers, but you were. It's a strong charge, but it's factual. Verse 53, the last words of Stephen to these people in his message. You who have received the law, already established, but here's the, the next thing that's important. By the direction of angels. I sent you Abraham, Joseph, all the prophets. I carried you, I delivered you through the Red Sea, the crossing of the Jordan. I led you through the time of the judges and the kings where the kings went from good to bad to worse. And I led you all the way through those things. And even angels you won't listen to. Well, verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Oh, good. You ever been cut to the heart? The word of God is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts going in, cuts coming back out. It's important whose hand that sword is in. When it's in the hands of Jesus, you're like, thank you. Reading Samuel, minding my own business, and the Holy Spirit used a passage. Saul being chased after. By, or I'm sorry, David being chased after by Saul. Saul, out of his mind, David loves him and has served him and done nothing to King Saul. But King Saul just knows that David is out to get him. And he's chasing him around with a spear. And he throws a spear so that he could pin David to the wall. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, that's what you're doing to your son. Whoa, what? I didn't know, Lord, thank you. But you see, these uncircumcised hearts can't hear rough news like that, can it? How many people walk out of churches because the pastor gave some rough news, spoke the word of God, and they didn't like it? How dare you tell me how to live? I'm not telling you how to live. The Bible is telling you how to live. And it's your choice whether or not to, and it was my choice whether or not to listen to that. 
No, God was saying, and he was right, you're being too hard on your son. He's not perfect. You aren't perfect. Stop demanding that he be perfect. I'm thankful for the word of God. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. They were cut to the heart, but unfortunately these guys had the wrong kind of cutting. They didn't get the cutting done on their heart or their ears. Because God's word is effective on every single heart. Is not my word a hammer, God says. It can crush a hard heart. But he won't force himself. And notice that they gnash their teeth at him. I came up with a picture that I think kind of gets it across. Arr! They're cut to the heart. They weren't like, I was, thank God it was like that. Arr, how dare you, God, tell me what to do, you know? They're like after Stephen. They're gnashing their teeth. Arr! What a description. Their hatred and their anger shown. They don't want to listen to their message anymore. I want to go on being self-deceived that I'm a good person. Thank you very much. This is what they see. Their uncircumcised hearts hear the word and they're filled with wrath and murder. But notice the contrast. Stephen, but he, full of the Holy Spirit, he sees something completely different. Notice that contrast. He got that through faith, through humbling himself before God by believing the truth. They see hatred. Stephen sees heaven. Look at it with me. He says, but being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven. Hey, when you're having troubles, that's a good place to look. Gaze into heaven. Look intently. I see the heavens opened. He gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. Saw the glory of God. No man can see the glory of God. Oh, because we know the end of the story. He's about to die. And God opens it up and he sees it. This glorious thing. This is, this is not like he sees it in mind's eye. I literally think he's standing there and the heavens opened up. It happened to Ezekiel. Oh, this is terrible. We're going to get defeated. We don't have enough people. God goes, yeah, let me open up the curtain. And he sees this vast army, this spiritual army behind him. Let's go forward. God will show us things like that from time to time. We'll see his glory. And he sees this next thing. He sees the Son of Man. He sees Jesus standing. Underline that in the Bible with me. Standing. Not seated. See, the priest has two duties to perform. Overseeing sacrifices and then sustaining the people, taking care of them. When he died on the cross and rose again from the dead, he then went to heaven after he appeared to over 500 people here on earth and ate with them and all those things. And then he ascended back to heaven where he is seated at the right hand of God. Seated because he fulfilled his mission here on earth. He provided salvation to Telestai. It is finished. But however, there's a secondary work. The priest isn't going to sit down on the job. His job is to sustain us. To get us saved. That's, that's step one, right? But now let's grow in Christ. Let's, let's, and he is there. Not seated, but as the high priest standing, observing what's going on down there and seeing his boy, Stephen. And I can't help but think that he is going like this. Good job, Stephen. A life well lived. Very short life. One message done. I've been blessed to be able to preach a, a few more than that. does beg that question this, this is a hard outcome he preaches a message and he's dead what's up with that God verse 57 then they cried out with a loud voice that is an onomatopoeia word onomatopoeia means words that sound like what they mean 
Sounds like a raven croaking. I, I don't know if that was a good impression of a raven, but we'll go with it. But they're, ah, you know, their teeth, they're gnashing, ah, and they cry out with a loud voice, megaphone, megaphone, loud voice. They stop their ears. We can't listen to this blast. It's like pious absurdity, right? Like you are forgetting that, oh, aren't you supposed to vote? You're, you're forsaking all the law in order to protect the law. They're hypocrites, but they stop their ears. We can't listen to him blaspheming against God. He's not blaspheming against God. He's telling the truth, but they won't hear it. And them stopping their ears isn't preventing them from hearing it. They have uncircumcised ears. That's why they can't hear it. They will not humble themselves. And they ran at him with one accord. The church, one accord. All the time we see that, right? The church is in one accord, one accord. They're all together. Homo thumadon is the Greek word. All together, one heart, one passion. Isn't that wonderful? I, I feel like this church, we're there. Like we have one heart. We're all headed toward becoming more like Jesus and sharing the love of Christ with a world that needs it. But know that the enemies of God can also have a similar fellowship, can't they? And they stopped their ears. They ran them with one accord and then they cast them out. That's them following the law. You're not allowed to stone people within the temple gates. So they take them out there and they're going to stone them. Where was Jesus uh, crucified? Same outside the camp on a garbage dump called Gehenna. Ekbalo is the word cast. It means to throw it away. Like you don't even care. Like it's an old pair of dirty sneakers and you're like, I'll be happy if I never see those again. It's mob rule. There's no law here. No trial, no vote. They're so angered that they broke the law in order to exact judgment. And then the witnesses laid their clothes. What an interesting little thing here. Was his life worthwhile? Was, was it worthwhile to share the gospel with these guys one more time? I would say absolutely. But this makes it even more so. What does it mean the witnesses laid down their clothes? A couple of things. Um, first of all, uh, they had outer clothing. Okay, They would have these outer coats, long coats, like a robe. Like I was going to wear a robe today, but I decided not to. Or picture me in a three-piece suit. Go ahead and picture that because you'll never see it. Except in, when I'm in the, you know. <laughs> but, you know, you ever watch a, like a president with a three-piece suit try to throw out the first ball at a ball game? You know, they're all constricted. I can't throw my fastball with that, so they take off their outer coats. Also, they are witnesses, and by doing so, they are saying, we are witnesses. They lamb at Paul's, I'm sorry, Saul's feet, okay? Because here's what they would do. Deuter Deuteronomy told them, listen, to, to make sure that there's not so many false accusations, the person that accuses is the one who has to pick up the first stone. Rings a bell? The woman caught in adultery? Jesus says, you who is without sin... Go ahead and cast the first stone because if you're going to bring a false accusation, you also better bring that stone. And so if Dan um, falsely accused my brother Dan of something before everybody else, now it's my job to pick up the stone and to be the first one to... Th I can't do it. It's meant to prevent a lot of false accusation. I think it was probably somewhat effective so that's why the clothes. And they lay it in a man's feet named Saul, Saul of Tarsus. He didn't participate, but he was a witness. He saw Stephen. Don't you think that left an indelible thing in his mind to watch a true man of God, a person who loves Jesus, and to watch, and to watch how he spoke to these men with love. No doubt there was love in his message. Won't you listen, you stiff-necked, hard-hearted, obstinate people? Won't you listen? They say Philo or Philo, a Greek philosopher, tells us that he was probably 21 to 21, 28 years old. They say he's a young man, Stephen. 
And Saul was there. And they stoned Stephen, meaning they kept on stoning him. And he's talking. But who's he talking to? He's talking to them first. Verse 56, look, I see heaven opened up. When, when God shows you heaven's opening up, you can't keep your mouth shut. I would defy Like if you have given your life to the Lord, you can't help but tell people about Jesus. He's shown you such great and unsearchable things that you didn't know, right? And you just, oh, look. They can't see it, though. Only Stephen can see it because his heart's circumcised. His ears are circumcised. And they stoned him. And then he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Reminds me of what our Lord and Savior said on the cross. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. Not only that, notice verse 60. Stephen knelt down. Submission, you can stone me to death, but just like my Lord and Savior said, you can kill the body, but you cannot kill my soul. And with a loud voice, notice that. Same thing, megaphone. Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Amazing. You know your heart's gripped by Jesus when you say things like that. You're not calling down hatred. My God's going to smite you. And <laughs> No. Do not charge them with this sin. There's a man with God's heart. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Isn't that great? Take that to heart. Whatever it, your time is, when you take your last breath, you're just falling asleep. Death, where is your sting? We have Jesus Christ as our Savior. And when we take our last breath here, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Father, we thank you for this passage and thank you for these wonderful people, Lord, who you have first given life to and then given new life to through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for this witness of Stephen. Thank you for the things that we've learned this morning, the strength that we've gained by knowing this man. We look forward to meeting him in heaven, Lord, and asking him questions and all the like. But Lord, we thank you for this testimony of this life that was well-lived because, Lord, we know this Saul became Paul, the Apostle Paul, who went around the entire known world at that time evangelizing and bringing thousands of people to Christ and, and starting many, many churches because he, too, eventually got that circumcised heart and circumcised ears so that he could hear and he could believe upon you. We desire the same, Lord. Send us out by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.